Hi, I'm Bryce. Welcome to Math CS220. In this video, I want to give you a sense of what to expect from this class, both in terms of content and organization. We'll come back to content in a moment, but first I want to bring up a couple of pedagogical concepts that guide how this course is laid out. Both of these approaches are based in research on how students learn most effectively and on my experience as an instructor. The first concept is standards-based grading, where the largest portion of your grade will be based on how many of the course concepts you can demonstrate mastery of by the end of the semester. For each topic, you will have many opportunities to demonstrate mastery, but there also won't be much in the way of partial credit, because mastery means getting it fully correct. The reasons behind this are, first, that we all come in with different amounts of background knowledge, and what's important is not how quickly we understand something, but rather that we put in the work to eventually understand it fully. And second, that we all make mistakes, but when we do, we should take another shot rather than moving on without fixing them. The other important pedagogical idea is the flipped classroom, which is motivated by the idea that the best way to learn challenging concepts is by hands-on practice with lots of opportunities to ask questions and get quick feedback. To facilitate this, we will spend as much of our class time as possible working on problems in small groups, which means that your first introduction to the material needs to come outside of class. So every day there will be readings and videos that you are expected to complete before coming to class. Readings will come from this textbook, and I've been working on a library of videos for discrete structures that I will be adding to this semester. That means you'll see some lecture videos from previous semesters, some brand new ones, and some, like today's, with an older core and some newer updates. We'll talk more about the course structure and answer your questions about all of this when we go over the syllabus on the first day of class. But for now, let's turn it over to past Bryce to talk a bit about discrete mathematics and proof writing. By way of an introduction to what this class is about, I wanted to lead with a really terrible card trick. Don't expect anything exciting from this trick. It's deliberately simple, both so that I can do it and so that we can prove things about it in a bit. The idea here is that I have a deck of 52 cards, which I will give a few shuffles. And now I want to split the deck evenly into top and bottom halves. And now I want to take a look at the number of red cards in the top half of the deck. I have 12 red cards in the top half of the deck. And the question is, how many black cards are there in the bottom half of the deck? In the bottom half of the deck, we had exactly 12 black cards. Was it just a coincidence that I got the same number when I counted the red cards in the top half and the black cards in the bottom half? Well, let's try it again and see if the pattern holds. I got 16 red cards in the top half of the deck, and 16 black cards in the bottom half. One more try. 14 and 14. So can we expect this to keep happening? Well, I could sit here and keep shuffling and counting cards, but I'm a computer scientist. I could go write a program in Python to do this a thousand times and tell me if the number of red cards in the top half is always equal to the number of black cards in the bottom half. So why don't we go do that? Here I've written some Python code that can create a 52 card deck. We've imported a function to shuffle the order of the cards, and then we can cut the deck and count the number of red and black cards in the top and bottom piles respectively. So we can test out the trick more efficiently by running it here. And we again get the same number of red cards in the top half as black cards in the bottom half. And this seems to be happening every time, but with the Python code we can easily run an experiment where we do this a thousand times, and here we've printed out all of the pairs of how many red cards in the top 
and how many black cards in the bottom half of the deck, and they matched all 1,000 times. So, are we convinced that this is always going to work? Well, this experiment has provided evidence, but it hasn't provided mathematical proof. To consider another example, I've also written a program that generates a random prime and checks whether that random prime number is even. And if I run that program for a thousand experiments, we generated a thousand random prime numbers and all of them were odd. But does that demonstrate that all prime numbers are odd? No, there is an obvious counterexample, which is that 2 is an even number that is prime. So in the case of generating random prime numbers, there is only one counterexample, and if I'm generating random prime numbers, that counterexample is very unlikely to occur. So do we think that we have covered all of the possibilities for the card trick? Well, to get a sense of that, we need to figure out how many shuffles and splits of the deck are possible. Counting the number of possibilities is something we'll know how to do soon, but the result is a very large number, and so to exhaustively explore all of them is not very practical. So instead, let's go back to the whiteboard and see if we can come up with a convincing proof that the number of red cards in the top half will always be the same as the number of black cards in the bottom half. So the Python program gave us evidence that the trick works most of the time, but as we saw with generating prime numbers, seeing it work many times in a row is not a guarantee that it will always work. So instead we'd like to come up with a proof that the number of red cards in the top half of the deck is always equal to the number of black cards in the bottom half. To begin writing our proof, let's define some terms. Here I've defined R to be the number of red cards in the top half of the deck, and B to be the number of black cards in the bottom half. And our hope is that we can show that R and B are always equal. Let's be optimistic and write that conclusion at the end of our proof and see if we can fill in the details in between. To fill in the gap, let's think about what we know about R and B. The full deck contains 52 cards, and so when we split it, both the top and bottom halves have 26 cards. And then we sorted through the top half of the deck to pull out the red cards, and there were R of them. But of the 26 cards in the top half of the deck, all the rest of them must be black. So we know how many black cards we have in the top half of the deck. So with 26 minus R black cards in the top half of the deck, we can now think about how many black cards are left in the bottom half of the deck. Well, to begin with, the deck had 26 black cards, and those black cards were split into some in the top half and some in the bottom half. So whichever black cards are not in the top half must now be in the bottom half. So, the number of black cards in the bottom half must be 26 minus however many were in the top half. And since we just figured out the number of black cards in the top half, we can substitute that here. And now we can simplify and we get that B and R are equal. And so now we have a mathematical proof that the card trick will work every time. So what did we get from this example? Well, first of all, it demonstrated the process of how progress happens in math. When we tried the card trick a few times by hand, and then many more times on the computer, we noticed an obvious pattern, that R and B were always the same. 
and so we made a conjecture, guessing that this pattern would always hold, no matter how we shuffled the deck. But by generating random prime numbers, we might have been led to a similar conjecture, that prime numbers are always odd, and there our two paths diverged. In one case, we found a counterexample showing that our conjecture was not true, and in the other case, we were able to construct a proof showing that our conjecture held. The other takeaway from this is a baseline example of a proof. One of the big goals of this class is to help you develop skills in mathematical proof writing. So it's worth pausing for a moment to ask, what is a proof? Well, the proof at the end of our example was a written argument where each sentence followed logically from the last. And in general, a proof is a written argument showing that a statement must be true. This definition from the book is a great one, emphasizing that a proof is a type of essay. And it is often very useful to think of proofs as essays, because they share a lot of features with essays that you would write for any other class. In particular, detailed explanations and clarity of writing are critically important to proofs. In addition, the process of writing a proof should involve drafts and revisions just like any other essay. I was only able to write the proof on the whiteboard in one go because I had written out a draft of it in my notes beforehand. But unlike many other essays, proofs have some very strong constraints on their structure, and that's expressed here by the idea that a proof is incontrovertible. Many essays you might write have a possible counter-argument, but if you have completed a rigorous proof, there should be no room for someone who accepts the starting assumptions to disagree. We'll be writing lots of proofs this semester, so we'll come back to this many times, but I want to start with some general advice for writing proofs in a math or computer science class. In the example of the card trick, it would have been easy to skip lots of steps and assume that our reader was following along. But to ensure that our writing is clear and precise, it helps to slow down and write in complete sentences. As I mentioned, it also helps a lot to revise your proofs after you have written them once. And we'll talk soon about LaTeX, which is a language for typesetting mathematical notation that will make your life easier and your submissions much more beautiful. One more piece of advice that probably comes in even before you start writing is that my steps of how math happens very deliberately ended with prove or disprove. It's very easy when you have made a conjecture to get caught up in the idea that you need to prove that conjecture. But really, a proof or a disproof of the conjecture is an equally good result. As an example, there are many famous conjectures in math, statements that we think might be true, but we haven't yet been able to prove. A simple one to write down is Goldbach's conjecture, which is that every even number bigger than 2 is the sum of two primes. Like any other, this conjecture arises out of noticing a clear pattern. If we write down the first few even numbers, we can easily come up with primes that sum to them, and brute force computational search has shown that this pattern holds up through ludicrously large even numbers. But despite centuries of effort, the general conjecture remains unproven. And at this point, it would be an equally awesome result to either prove that this pattern must always hold for any even number, or to find just a single counterexample disproving the conjecture. So at this point, we've touched on the biggest topic in this course, which is writing proofs. And we'll go into much more depth on proof writing with formal logic and proof techniques and templates. But we've also touched a bit on some of the other discrete math topics that will come up throughout the class, such as counting, like the case of counting how many ways there are to shuffle and split the deck of cards, and probability, where we might think about how likely is it 
that when we generate a thousand random primes, we only see odd ones, or many other questions, like when we generated splits of the deck, the significant majority had a double-digit number of red cards in the top half and black cards in the bottom half, but not all. And so we might ask, what is the probability when we split the deck that the number of red cards in the top half is at least 10. Over the course of the semester, we'll also dive much more into the mathematical foundations of computer science, including sets and functions, growth rates and big O notation, and graphs and trees. And we'll also connect the mathematics back to computer science through labs where we'll learn functional programming. So I hope you're as excited for this class as I am, because I'm looking forward to a great semester.